Welcome to AccuWeather's Ask the Experts. I'm your host, Jeff Cornish. We go beyond the forecast to give you the how and why on all the cool and interesting things that you have wondered about and wanted to ask in weather, space, and science. And in today's show, we talk to someone who comes face to face with some of the worst weather in the world, but the information and research that he and other pilots and crew members give the weather world is invaluable when it comes to helping predict the biggest storms on Earth. So we're talking about the Hurricane Hunters program, and joining us is Commander Adam Abbottball, uh, and he is a pilot and chief of operations at NOAA's Aircraft Operations Center in Lakeland, Florida. Adam, thank you so much for being here with us. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. As a, a Navy pilot, you earned several medals for flying missions in Iraq and Afghanistan early in your career. Did you think you would transition from flying in battle to battling the elements flying into hurricanes? Yeah, it's been a fun transition for sure. I mean, I grew up in Florida, so I was keenly aware of the Hurricane Hunters and their mission, and uh, honestly, the impacts that storms have on Florida and the impact that the Hurricane Hunters have on providing the track and intensity forecast. So I thought it'd be a really cool thing to transition out of my Navy career, continue my service to the country, and, and be able to do this and give back. Well, that's fantastic. Now, uh, I learned a few things in talking to you just before this uh, show began uh, about uh, the Hurricane Hunter program as uh, we realized that, that there's an Air Force aspect to this and then also NOAA aspect to this. So can you talk about the overall structure of the Hurricane Hunter program and how these two agencies work together? Yeah, Jeff, so we're all part of one big team, right? Just like satellites and buoys and, and other sort of observational instruments. But the Air Force does have C-130s that they fly into the storm. We fly P-3s into the storm. The main difference being um, our, kind of our mission set, right? The Air Force goes in to fix the center of the storm. That's, that's their primary mission. Whereas uh, NOAA, we fly the most advanced weather aircraft on the planet. And so our aircraft is outfitted with a host of instrumentation and radars and, and a bunch of really advanced scientific uh, gathering uh, instrumentation and, and weather gathering tools that help not only inform the current track and intensity forecast, but also help build the understanding for future modeling, future algorithms, future understanding of storm dynamics and complexity. So we really got to, we, the NOAA side gets to hit both uh, kind of the, the current and the future parts of, of hurricane research and hurricane operations. And how does this actually function? Uh, can you talk uh, about uh, what you actually do as a hurricane hunter uh, in terms of flying into these storms? How high up are you going? And what uh, kinds of things are you looking for within uh, a tropical system? It's a great question. It's one we get often, obviously. But we go into the storm, right, right in the heart of the storm, about eight to 10,000 feet um, into the storm, because that's really where we can get the best data, but also do it safely for our crewed aircraft. So. We go into the storm, we drop our, uh, our bread and butter instruments, a drop wind son. It collects all the atmospheric state variables that you need to understand the storm. So temperature, humidity, winds, um, pressure, and it radios it back to us. And then we therefore radio it back to the National Hurricane Center in Miami. And they ingest that in the models and out pops the track and intensity forecast that you see on the news to help inform the, the local populations. This sort of thing would have been unfathomable 100, 120 years ago. So let's talk about the history of Hurricane Hunters. When did this program develop and, and who came up with the idea of actually flying into these storms, the things that commercial pilots and private pilots would try to avoid? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the myth goes, and I think it's pretty true, it was a bar bet back in Texas, I think in the 40s or 50s or something. Uh, someone, someone did the flight, they survived. They ended up standing up a program to to realize that there's a lot of value in getting into the storm. Uh, even today, with all of our advanced technology, satellites and, and observable uh, buoys in the ocean, they're not able to get all the data that we can in a crewed aircraft. So our job is still vitally important today. We still collect data that you can only get from sending a crewed aircraft into the center of the storm. And the nice part is we can meet the storm wherever it is, right? So uh, other instrumentation might have to wait for the storm to pass over it or get near it we can go and deploy and meet the storm wherever it is and get that information in real time. Very cool, and we're showing some uh, imagery from uh, both the NOAA side and also the Air Force. So talk about your role and uh, then the roles of others in the crews that are on board uh, some of the NOAA jets. Yeah, so it's really a team atmosphere and it's so much fun. That's why I'm still here. That's why I love doing this job. Uh, I'm one of the pilots, obviously, but uh, up front with us in the flight station, we have a flight engineer that is vitally important to controlling power and oil and a lot of the the, the critical functions of the, of the aircraft. Then we have a flight director, which is a meteorologist, a navigator. We have a data systems operator. 
and we have a, a, a person in the back, an AVAPS operator that drops those instruments I was talking about, those, those drop wind sounds. Now that's just the NOAA component. In addition to that, we take a lot of um, hurricane researchers with us. We'll take a lot of uh, scientists that have their instruments on board that are helping to collect some very, uh, very specific or bespoke data that is helping understand uh, their, um, their concept of the storm. So it's a, it can be a full house on the plane, you know, 15, 18 folks or so at a time uh, go flying through the storm. Uh, but it's a, it's a really beautiful shared experience. We're all up there together having fun, getting through the storm and, and doing what I call the, the most fun you can have in aviation. That sounds pretty amazing. So what's the training like to be part of this? You know, clearly you got to have a, a lot of pilot background, a lot of pilot training to be one of the pilots. And then even then, when you show up, like uh, as you referenced, I showed up uh, with quite a bit of experience and with a decade of experience from the Navy. I still had to, uh, several years worth of on-the-job training, right? It's exposure to the storms. It's understanding how to fly the storm through or the aircraft through the storm, uh, understanding uh, what the crew dynamics are like and what the mission set is. So you can put the plane in the best position to get the data that, that you need. So... Uh, several years worth of on-the-job training before you can uh, become one of a, what we call a hurricane aircraft commander or a hack. And how many Hurricane F Hunter flights have uh, you made? And uh, tell us about some of the hurricanes that you've flown into. Yeah, so uh, I'm very fortunate. This will be my 11th season. Uh, I'm not good at keeping track of how many storms. Uh, it's, it's over 200 hurricane penetrations, um, like 400 maybe, um, including tropical storms and everything else. So. Uh, somewhere around there is a, is a kind of a, a breadth of experience over the 11 years. I did get to fly, I think, two of the most memorable storms. Uh, Patricia in 2015 is the strongest storm uh, ever recorded in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, for better or worse, I was part of that crew, so that was fun and a lot of experience. And then, of course, uh, the, the latest one is uh, Hurricane Ian 2022, a pretty violent uh, landfalling Category 5 storm on the coast of Florida. Obviously, has a lot of... Uh, near and dear impact to us here who are uh, the NOAA hurricane hunters are in Lakeland, Florida. So we actually had to deploy to Houston just to fly the storm because we couldn't keep the aircraft in Lakeland, but we still had to conduct our mission and do our job. So uh, it was a lot going on at that time. We realized how important it was. It was also the first operational launch of, of a drone in the hurricane, uh, which has been marked in the Guinness Book of World Record, which I think is awesome. So really big uh, kind of memorable storms. Wow, that's quite the experience that uh, you've been part of in all that. Well, uh, Commander Abbott Ball, we do have a viewer question uh, that uh, comes from Alex in Florida. Alex writes, what safety precautions are taken before flying into a hurricane? And have you ever feared for your life in any of these experiences? Yeah, that's a great question, Alex. I mean, we, what we do, we like to say what we do is uh, hazardous. It's not dangerous. And the difference being that we think about all the risks and then we try to mitigate them as much as possible. So we definitely understand and recognize it's a hazardous job. Uh, what we try to do is minimize our exposure to the really bad turbulence, the really bad convective areas, though we recognize that that's just impossible at times. Um, we are very well trained. Everyone on that aircraft is exceptionally well trained. We have five point shoulder harnesses. Uh, we do a lot of air crew training and safety training and water survival training. So we do a lot of work so that we can show up in the storm and be ready for whatever it throws at us. Well, that's really good to hear. Uh, we understand that uh, sometimes NOAA may fly into some other types of weather environments separate from tropical systems uh, to better sample maybe the environment around uh, a nor'easter uh, for model improvements. Have you been part of some of that uh, expansion of the program in recent years? I have. It's, it's actually been on kind of two different sides. We have a, a, a G4 a high altitude jet that we send over to the West Coast to do atmospheric river uh, work down in the winter. So they'll do uh, all those atmospheric rivers that we've been seeing a lot about lately on the West Coast, hitting California and Oregon. Uh, they'll go sample that. Um, and then the one you're referring to is kind of what we call our Ocean Winds Winter Project. They're, they're just like you said, they're bomb cyclones in the North Atlantic in the winter. So it's basically a low pressure hurricane with ice. So I think, honestly, it's some of the harder flying that we do, uh, even more so than a hurricane, because you get a lot of the same components and you throw in a couple extra hazards like ice, uh, really bad IMC, and, um, and then it gets a, a little fun sometimes. <laughs> That sounds pretty wild. Well, as an end user of the computer models, we all benefit from that uh, uh, here at AccuWeather and elsewhere. So uh, really fascinating stuff. And this is great information so far. We've only just begun. We have plenty more coming up uh, after the break in uh, just a little bit, Adam. So we're looking forward to more 
with you. But also coming up later in WeatherWise, we're going to take a closer look at the top three costliest hurricanes to ever hit the United States. But next, it's really important that we sample each quadrant of the storm so that we understand the behavior and characteristics of each storm. We're taking a deeper look at the future of hurricane research and we're answering more of your questions when Ask the Experts returns. So stay with us right here on the AccuWeather Network. Welcome back to AccuWeather's Ask the Experts. I'm your host, Jeff Cornish. We are talking about the people who fly into hurricanes to give us that very important information we need to help predict these big, impactful, and dangerous storms and getting insight on what they do and why they do it. So joining us again is Commander Adam Abbottball, who is a pilot in the Hurricane Hunter program with NOAA. And Adam, uh, as we continue the conversation, uh, we want to learn more about what you do and, and how this all works. How about the airplanes that you fly? Uh, how are uh, the planes that you fly more equipped to fly into these conditions? Yeah, we fly a, a Lockheed product, the P3 Orion. It's a weather variant called the WP3D. We have two of them. Uh, they have nicknames, Kermit and Piggy. Uh, but uh, they are they're, they're tanks. I mean, they were built in the 70s, purpose-built for NOAA. And uh, what we do with them is, is, uh, is some incredible work, obviously, in the storm environment. We are actually looking to upgrade. Uh, they're reaching the end of their service life. And so uh, we are looking to get new aircraft and recapitalize our, our hurricane aircraft fleet. So we're going to transition to C-130s, which is a, another amazing Lockheed product. Uh, but we're going to transition to those uh, pretty soon here, by 2029, 2030, somewhere around there, and, and be able to continue this the mission set that we provide uh, with the crewed aircraft into the storms. And as an outsider, uh, it, it seems to me that the, the Air Force Hurricane Hunters, they fly the C-130s. They're a physically larger plane. Is that right? Yeah, it's actually uh, similar enough in size. Okay. They have a high wing. We have a low wing. We actually use a very similar engine. It's almost the same engine, uh, different propellers. Uh, but otherwise, um, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's similar enough in size. One's built a little more for speed. One's built a little more for power. But overall, the dimensions are, are close enough. But uh, we're going to be joining the Air Force with those C-130J models, uh, again, about 2030 or so. Fascinating. Well, we want to talk about the instruments that you have on board of a flight. So what are the pieces of information that you gather and transmit to the weather world? Yeah, Jeff, I previously talked a little bit about the drop wind sond. Uh, everyone in the weather world is kind of familiar with them. It's the opposite of an upwind sond, which is like a kind of a balloon launch that you see from the shore. But it collects all the kind of the four or five big um, atmospheric variables that we need to measure, pressure, temperature, humidity, wind, speed, and direction. Uh, we also, what makes NOAA really unique is our 3D tail Doppler radar. It's the only planes in the world that have them. And what it does is it's an X-band uh, vertically scanning tail Doppler radar. So as we fly through the storm, you can think of it as us taking like a CAT scan or an MRI of the storm uh, as we go through. And that provides a significant benefit to the understanding of the dynamics of a storm. Uh, we also have um, a three uh, a 360 degree uh, radar underneath us. It's uh, horizontally scanning, so it helps us see ahead of us where where we're going and and what's behind us. We have a host of other instrumentation, including lidar, W band radars, uh, KA uh, band radars. So a lot of different radars and instrumentation that help us measure uh, a lot of the the different parts of the storm, including like even um, atmospheric cloud droplets. Uh, so some of the aerosols in the storm. It's really amazing what we can do with these planes. Really cool. Well, what's the length of a typical flight? And uh, sometimes we have a lot of traffic in the Atlantic with multiple storm threats uh, in a matter of six, 700 miles. Do you ever investigate more than one storm at a time with a single flight? Yeah, not at a single flight. Each flight is dedicated to a single storm, but we can do successive storms on successive days. And of course, you'll remember the record-breaking 2020 season. Uh, we were doing that quite a bit. Um, but yes, we can do about eight to nine hours is the typical mission set in a, in a storm. 
we fly it to the store and we cut it up basically like a pizza, if you can imagine it that. So it's really important that we sample each quadrant of the storm so that we understand the behavior and characteristics of each storm. So we'll do that. We'll fly eight to nine hours, come land and turn around and do it the next day. So they can be really long, really exhausting, tiring days uh, because flying eight to nine hours is one thing. Flying eight to nine hours in a hurricane, as you can imagine, uh, it's a little more. So <laughs> it I can believe be tiring. That. I believe that. Well, it is time for another viewer question. This one's in video form from Kendall in Pennsylvania. So, Kendall, uh, what do you want to ask the experts? What advice do you have for students who want to get into this program and one day become hurricane hunters? Yeah, Kendall, happy to answer that question. Uh, from a pilot standpoint, if you're looking to be a pilot uh, or even a meteorologist or navigator or data operator on the back, we really emphasize a, a STEM degree and a STEM background. So science, technology, engineering, and math uh, here at NOAA. Uh, if you want to be a pilot, uh, we are hiring right now, actually. Uh, so most uh, we're looking for people with commercial pilot's license that already have their commercial. And then we will bring you up and we'll train you probably on a light aircraft first. NOAA has some King Airs and Twin Otters. And then we bring you on to fly the, the heavy aircraft to um, either the G4 or the P3 to go fly into the storm. So it, uh, it can be a little bit of a longer track, but uh, I can promise you the reward is worth it. Well, it seems like a nice payoff. Uh, if you're looking for an office with a view, that uh, stadium effect there inside the eye of the storm must be a spectacular thing to experience. Uh, and briefly, Adam, uh, I believe there's a website people can go to if they're interested in getting into this program. Is that right? Yeah, there is. Um, I think uh, Jonathan, uh, our, our PAO, uh, Jonathan Shannon, has the uh, website, but omao.noaa.gov should be the website you can go to. You can learn more about being a NOAA Corps officer. You can learn more about uh, hurricane hunting. And that's just a, a really good place to, to get uh, informed and find some resources if you are interested in, in uh, becoming a NOAA Corps officer. That's really cool. And just in a couple of seconds, uh, what's it like to be in the middle of a storm like this in that stadium effect area? I mean, that's definitely the reward, right? It's a, it's a long slog to get there. And then, uh, so you get a couple minutes, a couple seconds, depends on the size of the eye of reprieve. And that view is, uh, is quite stunning, as you've noticed from some of the pictures and, and talking about it. But I love really, it. It's why really we're cool still stuff. here doing it. It's a blast. That's great. Well, again, Commander Abbott Ball, on behalf of all of us here at AccuWeather, thanks again for your service to our country and to the whole weather community. And for all you and your fellow Hurricane Hunter crew members and planes do for our increased knowledge about current and also future storms and hurricanes. So thanks again for joining us. Thank you. Great stuff, Adam. After the break, it's time for WeatherWise as we look at the top three costliest hurricanes in U.S. history when Ask the Experts returns. Welcome back to AccuWeather's Ask the Experts. It is time for WeatherWise, and today we're looking at the three costliest hurricanes to hit the United States. First, Hurricane Sandy. In October of 2012, Sandy began in the Caribbean and tracked up the U.S. East Coast. While it wasn't officially a hurricane when it made landfall in New Jersey, the superstorm unleashed hurricane force winds and a catastrophic storm surge with flooding from New York to Connecticut, also in New Jersey. The monster storm caused 147 fatalities and AccuWeather determined the economic cost of Sandy at $210 billion. Next, Hurricane Harvey. In August of 2017, this Category 4 hurricane slammed into the Gulf Coast. It then stalled over Texas, delivering between 40 and over 60 inches of rain in the Houston area. That led to catastrophic flooding and more than 100 deaths and $230 billion in damage. In August of 2005, Katrina first made landfall in Florida, regained strength in the warm Gulf water, making landfall a second time in Louisiana, this time as a Category 3 hurricane. It had powerful winds in the storm surge, and levees in New Orleans failed, leaving about 80% of the city underwater. Katrina caused more than 1,800 fatalities, and according to AccuWeather, $320 billion in damages. Remember, hurricane season runs from June to November every year, and you can best be prepared by keeping track of the latest forecast on AccuWeather, AccuWeather.com, the AccuWeather app, and here on the network. Thanks so much for joining us on AccuWeather's Ask the Experts. I'm Jeff Cornish. If you have a question, remember, uh, about weather, space, or science, you can always write us or send us a video question at asktheexperts at accuweather.com. You can also call us at 888-566-6606. Have a great one.